morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers. Yes, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another edition of very informative lecture series for you. The speaker for the first session of today's webinar is an honored guest from the USA, Professor Sandy Lamb. Professor Lamb is the Chief of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital, Chicago. Her clinical interests are focused upon minimally invasive surgeries of pediatric brain and spine. She also specializes in epilepsy surgery. She is a renowned author with several publications and journals and book chapters. We are extremely honored to have her today as a speaker at our webinars, and today she will be talking about expanding the application of neuroendoscope in pediatric neurosurgery. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from Taiwan, Professor Sebastian Liao. Professor Liao is an attending neurosurgeon at the Department of Neurosurgery, Neurological Institute, Taiching Veterans General Hospital, Taiwan. Dr. Liao is an United faculty to various workshops and con conferences conducted worldwide, and is also a noted author with several publications in various peer reviewed journals. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars, and today we'll be talking about microsurgery for paraclinoid aneurysms. The chair for the first session of today is our a distinguished and honorable senior faculty from Germany, Professor Concesio Di Rocco. Professor Di Rocco is the Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery, International Neuroscience Institute, Hanover at Otto Van Gurich University, Germany. He is also a consultant in the Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery, Catholic University Medical School, Rome. He was a past chairman of the Education Committee of the WFNS and also the direct past president of the ISPN. He, was, he, he has written several articles in reputed journals and book chapters. He is a current editing chief of the prestigious, prestigious journal, Child's Nervous System. We are extremely grateful to Professor Diroko for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Sandy Lamb. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Kazuhiro Hongo. Professor Hongo is the director of the Ina Central Hospital, Koshiro Kubo, Ina City, Nagano Prefecture, Japan. He was the past chairman of the Shinshu University. His clinical expertise is focused upon cerebrovascular and skull based neurosurgery. He is also a noted author with several articles in various peer reviewed journals and also an invited faculty to various conferences and workshops worldwide. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting an invitation to chair the session of Professor Sebastian Liao. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to our first chair, Professor Kansas Yudi Roko. Kindly unmute yourself. We will start now. I am very happy to introduce Professor Sandy Lam. She is in charge of a, an historical department, the one founded by Anthony Raimondi, then was directed by McLaughlin, finally Tomnita, and now we have this uh, important direct female director that uh, she's very well known for a lot of uh, important contribution. I will say in all the fields of pediatric neurosurgery. Now I'm very curious, eager to see what she will say about the expansion of the endoscopic treatment in the pediatric population. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dr. DiRocco. Um, so, uh, and thank you to the organizing committee uh, of the ACNS. Uh, this is uh, truly a pleasure and an honor. So I am going to talk about um, expanding applications of endoscopic surgery and pediatric neurosurgery. Um, so it's going to be a little bit of a, a tour uh, around um, really expanding the, the approaches and, and the uses of neuroendoscopy. But, but we have to start with why, right? And, and it's really using a tool um, that's within our toolbox and we have um, a certain set of skills, but it doesn't mean that just because we have the tool, we should use it for everything, right? We should consider the approach and consider always what's best for the patient. Um, in, in terms of the, the endoscopy, you can minimize morbidity of the surgical access to be able to reach and see the, the tissues and the targets that you need to. And, and in the course of that, try to minimize tissue damage, minimize blood loss, minimize pain uh, and enhance recovery after surgery. So we'll, we'll talk about a few different topics. Uh, it's not meant to be in depth for every single one, but really to give you some food for thought. So in the treatment of neonates, when we look at the, the problem of intraventricular hemorrhage of prematurity, we, we have um, done a lot, uh, but there's still a lot that we don't know. 
So in terms of uh, premium IVH and germinal matrix hemorrhages, uh, we all use um, uh, the same classification. Um, and when we look at the high grade um, uh, premium IVH, uh, we know that there's actually a lot going on uh, in terms of what contributes to preemie IVH. And what we see is actually the intraventricular hemorrhage postnatally. But in the meantime, in, in that microenvironment, there are a lot of systemic factors and there's a lot of local factors. So it's not just the blood clot. There's um, uh, secondary factors and there's also uh, the comorbidities that the, the, the uh, premature neonate is facing. So when you look at just trends in hospitalization in the US, um, uh, the higher the grade of IVH, uh, the, the higher of um, healthcare utilization burden and the higher of uh, the higher the um, morbidity associated. So when you look at functional outcomes uh, of children with preemie IVH, what do we know? Um, and we know that the higher the grade, um, uh, really, there's a very high risk of cerebral palsy, uh, of communication issues, uh, of motor issues, not being able to ambulate, visual impairments, and epilepsy. This is that in graphical format. What do we know about intervention and what we can try to do to help? Um, we know that there are evidence-based guidelines um, from review of the literature, and we know that they're non-surgical and surgical temporizing measures. That says we can um, do temporizing measures in terms of OMI reservoirs, Rigam reservoirs, subcalial shunts, um, uh, EVDs, uh, lumbar punctures, but really it doesn't tell us exactly when to intervene or exactly how best to intervene. So uh, when my group did a uh, systematic review and meta-analysis, we saw that the later the timing of the temporizing measure um, actually had higher rates to conversion to BP shunt, and then actually worse outcomes of moderate to severe neurodevelopment uh, issues. When you look at actually radiographic measures and degree of ventricular megaly, the greater the degree of ventricular dilatation was actually independently associated with worse functional outcomes, regardless of whatever surgical intervention was done. So that sets the stage um, for you know, what's going on in, inside the ventricles um, and what we can do to help. So I won't get into the, the, the basic science, but understanding that there, there's an environment where, where the blood clot, um, as it is undergoing lysis, actually um, is contributing to um, uh, having higher levels of hemoglobin, bilirubin, iron, uh, that's um, associated with increased in, uh, ventricular size uh, clinically. So uh, we proposed a treatment pathway based on the literature um, for uh, when to get neurosurgery uh, involved uh, in all babies in, in the neonatal ICU, which is anybody with a grade three or grade four IVH. If they are less than two kilograms, uh, they are not candidates for ventricular peritoneal shunt by body weight. So we look at the um, criteria for um, treatment or temporizing measures and what the options are. So a very brief overview of um, the uh, hydrocephalus clinical research network uh, and what they've looked at in terms of temporizing studies. And um, in summary, really um, uh, looking at criteria for when to intervene, there was really not much difference between um, a tapping, serial tapping or subgaleal shunt in terms of conversion to uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt or to um, or, or infection outcomes. So these are the different options uh, that are described uh, and the different criteria set by the HCRN and we adapted those. And then looking at CSF diversion, uh, temporary or permanent. Um, and then also um, looking at uh, the role of endoscopy, uh, ETV or ETV plus cord plexus cauterization. So, um, there are ETV success scores that have been validated. Um, so Dr. Golkarni developed that and really it's been validated in different uh, patient populations um, uh, worldwide and adapted for certain populations such as in Uganda. So, um, so anybody who knows me uh, knows that uh, I, I would definitely consider neuroendoscopy um, uh, in, in anybody and then try to see if that's really the right thing to do.
So um, in terms of say post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, this is the, the typical way that um, uh, endoscopy in my hands would look. Um, so, um, and, and this would be considered a more kind of late intervention with larger uh, ventricular sizes already. But when you go in, you'll see that septum is typically already blown out from the severe uh, hydrocephalus. You'll see the hemosiderin staining in the ependymal lining. Um, and then you'll see the floor of the third ventricle. So um, I tend to use flexible neuroendoscopy um, and I'll show you uh, why in some cases. So always identifying the anatomy um, and uh, you're seeing the, uh, uh, looking really throughout the third ventricle first, then identifying the floor of the third ventricle. Uh, I always use the, um, the flexible bug be not connected to power to make sure that there um, is no transfer of heat energy. I perforate the floor of the third ventricle, and then go into the prepontine cistern. Uh, and with the um, uh, flexible neuroendoscope, um, uh, uh, as in the Ugandan experience with Dr. Worf, um, uh, really taking our time uh, to break up um, the uh, prepontine adhesions, and now you'll see definitely why this uh, bug bee is not connected to power uh, and really having really gentle blunt dissection and being able to manipulate that flexible neuroendoscope to be able to see uh, what we call a naked basilar artery, uh, vertebral artery, and uh, you'll see cranial nerves and, and making sure to um, have a perforation in both the horizontal reliquis and vertical liliquous membranes. Um, so I, I'm not done with the endoscopic third ventriculostomy uh, until I know that um, uh, we have visualized all of these targets and also uh, addressed um, your vertical liliquous that you'll see. Um, and then see after that, you'll actually see uh, the dura of the clivus as well. So that really um, the uh, all of the CSF spaces, including the subarachnoid spaces, are communicated. That's the vertebral artery there. And um, so we're really quite deep into the prepontine cistern here. But that really gives the best chance for uh, cerebral spinal fluid flow. And then uh, as we withdraw the endoscope, uh, you'll see a, uh, a really uh, great CSF pathway, good pulsations. Uh, that is the floor of the third ventricle. Uh, and um, usually these are uh, cases uh, with very good hemostasis and good hemo uh, visualization. This is the choroid plexus cauterization portion uh, where you do connect to power now for the cautery. You take your time uh, to uh, make sure that you don't cause bleeding, but you cauterize uh, the choroid plexus uh, very thoroughly uh, uh, from the lateral ventricles, the atrium, and into the temporal horn as well. So when you look at um, timing and then really the role of removal of blood products is waiting um, until you see that hemosiderin staining and waiting until that late stage with the uh, large ventricles, the, the way to, uh, to optimize outcomes. And there are many studies, many um, uh, high quality studies that, that really show that earlier intervention or um, uh, maneuvers to remove the blood um, in different ways may uh, have a role. So even though the DRIFT study and the DRIFT trial was uh, uh, closed early uh, because of hemorrhagic um, uh, issues, when you look at the 10-year post-hoc analysis, uh, the, the patients who actually had the intervention and the removal of blood products actually had much better, uh, significantly better uh, functional outcomes at 10 years. So when we look at that, is there a way to, to remove the blood products more safely and more directly? Uh, and our colleague um, uh, Uli Tamali uh, in Germany and his group uh, have been doing this for over 10 years um, and really showed the rationale for intervening with an endoscope. 
So, and then in terms of the neurodevelopment outcomes that they've shown at two years after the surgeries, they've been able to match the DRIFT study um, in terms of uh, the uh, neurocognitive um, uh, motor and um, uh, decrease in epilepsy, and also a decrease in ventricular peritoneal shunt rate. So uh, this is actually borrowed uh, from uh, Dr. Tamale. Um, show you kind of, I think, the salient uh, issues uh, here, which is actually when he puts in the endoscope um, uh, using the ultrasound, uh, you'll see that it's guided into uh, the ventricular space and then managing the inflow and outflow. And you'll see the outflow here and you'll see that kind of motor oil quality uh, of the uh, CSF uh, mixed with the intraventricular hemorrhage. And letting that out and you see the view in, in inside the ventricle is really not that great at first. Uh, and you have continuous irrigation to irrigate out uh, this um, uh, xanthochromic fluid. And over time, you'll see that this actually clears up and you'll see some of this blood clots coming out. And, um, and then you see the view actually gets more and more clear. And as you can um, actually directly irrigate the blood clots out, you can also directly suction out the blood clots uh, and really taking the time to make sure that you don't move the endoscope around until you can actually see where you're going, but, but really irrigating at first. Um, and then the other areas um, that you'll see here is that afterwards you actually get a good view um, inside. And then you can actually directly uh, use a syringe uh, if needed to put the endoscope uh, onto a blood clot to uh, suction that out. And then at the end um, is actually putting in um, uh, a, uh, um, a Rickham reservoir uh, or, um, uh, or a subgaleal shunt. So I, I, I like that technique because when you look at the literature and what it's kind of telling us is that when we intervene late, uh, the outcomes are, are really not as good as uh, early intervention. But um, the DRIFT trial has shown us that some intervention can actually cause morbidity. Um, so how do we do that more safely? And I think there's a role for endoscope there. And here uh, is another use of an endoscope in a neonate. Um, so uh, in more rare cases, like a, a, a ruptured aneurysm uh, in a newborn, how do you actually safely try to decrease the intracranial pressure and, to, uh, and try to um, stabilize the patient to be able to get to uh, uh, coiling of the aneurysm? So uh, we showed a transpontinel stereotactic um, endoscopic uh, aspiration uh, with an ultrasonic aspirator. Um, and this is kind of what the view looks like. Um, and, and as our um, Japanese colleagues show um, in adults, uh, evacuation of intraparenchymal hemorrhage uh, done in a controlled fashion can be very, very effective. Uh, I learned from our um, uh, colleagues on the adult side, uh, um, especially in the neuro neuroendoscopy world, and really adapted this for, for, um, for a baby. Um, and using a transfontanelle approach. And then you see that ultrasonic aspiration um, that can really help us uh, visualize uh, and to be able to do that without any, the morbidity of a, a, a craniotomy. Um, so that's kind of what that looks like. Um, these are very rare cases. So we'd have to um, look at that all together in collaboration. So uh, this is uh, the trophy registry. Um, uh, with um, the IFNE, uh, Dr. Tamale, um, Dr. Chanali, uh, Dr. Carney, and, and really so many colleagues from around the world. Um, and it's a, a global registry for um, neonatal uh, 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 hydrocephalus management and intraventricular hemorrhage management. So um, it's observational, uh, and we're enrolling all of our patients in that. So, um, I, so the, the answers are, are um, yet to come uh, and that field is evolving and very exciting. So I'd like to talk about um, hydrocephalus and, and really some evolutions there. Um, so one of the questions is uh, rigid endoscopy versus flexible endoscopy. And I've been kind of a little curious about this uh, because when you look at um, the ETV, endoscopic third ventriculostomy outcomes, 
um, and uh, and it's, it's uh, adoption and application around the world. Uh, this is the way I learned it uh, with straight endoscopy. And then when you look at um, really the uh, East African experience, it, it has been um, very impressive in terms of um, uh, shunt independence and management of hydrocephalus and what it's taught us in reverse innovation uh, to the developed world. So when you look at um, uh, the outcomes achieved uh, in this Ugandan population uh, versus the ETV success score, it's actually been very um, impressive. And, and I've, I've uh, uh, learned um, the, the techniques uh, uh, done in Uganda and, and, and really thought about what does that mean? Is it a different patient population? It certainly is, right? With a lot more post-infectious hydrocephalus and, and uh, uh, myelomeningocele uh, than, than the, uh, the developed world, uh, but also a slightly different tool, right? It's endoscopy, but it's um, rigid versus uh, flexible. Um, and when you look at different studies, uh, my group looked, um, uh, did a uh, meta-analysis as well. Uh, we found that there was no significant difference in outcomes uh, reported in the literature, but the, the groups that were treated with flexible neuroendoscopy tended to actually have a lower predicted ETV success score and had some similar um, outcomes. So uh, while other groups have not uh, found a difference. So um, no matter what tool you use, uh, what I learned is uh, don't try to hold your flexible endoscope, um, use the scope holder. Uh, and that really frees up your um, degrees of, uh, of freedom. So, um, you know, a post-resection hydrocephalus is, is, a, is a typically a little bit more bread and butter. Um, so um, I'll show um, a brief video of this. So, so if you're looking at, um, uh, if you are looking at um, this, uh, this is the floor of the third ventricle. Um, and, um, and then you can uh, uh, perforate that. Uh, and then you'll see another kind of familiar technique where you expand that with the Fogarty catheter um, uh, and the Fogarty balloon. So, um, and, and this um, I, I would think is actually a more straightforward approach um, that we typically don't see uh, those um, adhesions. Uh, in the prepontine cistern like we typically do see in um, uh, a post-infectious hydrocephalus or a post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. So here, when, when you blow up that, that Fogarty balloon, um, and, and you can look in a little bit, you, you really don't see um, those adhesions uh, in the prepontine cistern. And, and I would say here, um, in, in a, a typical um, a ETV scenario, um, you're, you're done. Right, so you look in, everything looks clear, uh, and um, and uh, and your ETV surgery uh, uh, appears complete, and that that is a great view. So um, so what if um, what what if it's a little bit less uh, straightforward of a picture? So what if you have a congenital hydrocephalus? And um, so actually here, let me go back to here. So th this, uh, this baby was born with a, a asymmetric ventricles with an um, enlarging uh, uh, ventricular system on the right side. And the septum was just really just bowing over and bulging over. And of course, um, uh, followed with a, um, a large head circumference as well. Um, so here, when, you looked, when I looked in, um, that's actually the foramen of Monroe. Um, and I can see the choroid, I can see the venous angle, and then see right there, it's actually the foramen of Monroe. So here with the flexible endoscope, I was able to uh, look um, uh, uh, inside uh, very carefully uh, and see if I can get through uh, and make that foramen of Monroe patent. And here, remembering not to put um, power to the bug bee. And then here, I'm actually able to get into the third ventricle now. And here, looking at the um, uh, at the floor of the third ventricle, and then proceeding on um, with the uh, with, with the ETV. So, um, in the interest of time, I'll show kind of the next case. So, what if it's something more complex, like shunted hydrocephalus already? that's post-hemorrhagic, but you have a loculated system. 
So here we have an enlarging uh, temporal cyst. Um, so uh, you can put in more catheters. Uh, you can try to do neuroendoscopy, but when you try to put an endoscope into this type of system, it's, it's often very difficult to navigate. So you can have neuronavigation, um, or uh, you can have augmented reality, um, or you can um, uh, or, or you can explore the system. So um, when you explore the system here, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, so neuronavigation is always very helpful uh, in this type of instance. And then also, so here I'm looking around, I'm looking for something familiar, right? When you use a flexible endoscope, it's, it's difficult to navigate. Um, if you use a straight endoscope, you can navigate an endoscope. So here I'm looking at the ventricular system. Uh, and then here I see choroid. And here, when I see choroid, that means that's an opportunity, right? You don't want to perforate anything you don't know what's on the other side. But there, that, that is clearly choroid to me um, from the temporal horn. And then now you can see that there, that's actually a very, very thin membrane that's causing that loculation. And then right there, right at the choroid, um, that's going in, into the, um, the atrium of the ventricle. Uh, and then being able to kind of develop that uh, again without having that uh, and uh, the bug be connected to power. And then really um, you can also use some, some hydro dissection to be able to, to uh, see irrigate and see what's mobile and what's not mobile uh, and, and see where really your thinnest opportunity is. So here, um, Really doing some more hydro dissection and then looking, um, being very careful here, um, right, right at that cord plexus um, and, and looking for a way through, which is right there where in that very kind of like dark area coming up and um, making sure we're not connected to power. And then just kind of taking down those adhesions very patiently. Uh, once we're through those adhesions um, and hydro dissecting as well, um, you'll see that uh, we're actually in, in this kind of area uh, where it appears different. Um, and we're actually in that uh, communication with the rest of the ventricular area now. Uh, and then uh, and there, there's the shunt catheter uh, that was on the other side. So now we have really kind of simplified that system um, so that now this one shunt and one shunt catheter uh, is able to drain that entire loculated system. So that uh, was not entirely straightforward, right? So, um, you know, we could have tried that with a, flat, uh, a rigid endoscope to try to find a straight path um, uh, and trusted the navigation, or we could have been patient to try to manipulate through that. Uh, another um, example is um, a, sorry, a posterior fossa cyst here, um, where um, the aqueduct appears quite large, uh, and, uh, and and really it doesn't look straightforward in, in that posterior fossa, right? It, it looks almost like an arachnoid cyst type of material. So, um, and, and then uh, and then also if you look at um, uh, the foramen magnum there appears to be a cystic membrane right there. So this is what um, this would look like. Uh, we would look at the, um, the floor of the third ventricle first. Um, and, uh, and then um, really identify all of our anatomy. Uh, I was curious about that dilated fourth um, ventricle, that dilated uh, aqueduct. So here I actually went through the aqueduct with a flexible endoscope um, and I'm able to see that cyst. And see, this is that cyst wall bulging right up at us. Um, and here, um, making a hole in that cyst uh, and with the flexible endoscope, um, being careful um, to uh, navigate um, into this area. Uh, and that's a beautiful view uh, of that um, arachnoid cyst in the fourth ventricle. So um, here, you know, I've theoretically I've kind of collapsed the, collapsed the cyst, but really I only have one hole in it. 
I could probably just do an ETV. Uh, but here um, I could see, right, you can see that to, I connected this to power right up against the bone and only right up against the bone to be able to perforate that very, very floppy membrane. And I had to use other tools uh, like a Fogarty balloon uh, because I didn't want to manipulate as I was through the uh, aqueduct and dilated that up. And then now you can see that whole cyst has collapsed. Um, and then here, then, then I uh, proceeded uh, to do uh, an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So you can see even with um, just management of that cyst, that floor of the third ventricle uh, is now um, very, very pulsatile, right? Um, and then an endoscopic third ventriculostomy uh, like you've seen before. So uh, what about other applications? So, you know, this uh, brain stem tumor is certainly not something I would say, let's take out with an endoscope, uh, but I did intervene on the hydrocephalus here uh, with an endoscope. Um, and, um, and, and here, you know, we can do an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Um, and then, you know, I thought about the aqueduct. Um, and then we also needed to do a biopsy uh, of, of that brain stem tumor because it looked atypical. So uh, we were going to do this in, in um, uh, different approaches and different steps. Uh, but here you'll see, um, you'll see actually, uh, when I looked inside um, to do the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, uh, I found a, quite a dilated um, uh, aqueduct. So here is uh, the, the floor of the, um, the third ventricle. Uh, and then um, we did the ETV here. Um, and using the same technique to be able to see that naked basilar artery um, and definitely not having the bug be connected to power. And after that, you'll see that we're here in the aqueduct. Um, I just wanted to see what I could see. Um, and, uh, you know, looking in here, um, navigating through the aqueduct, um, I realized I could see the tumor. Um, so there's that bulging tumor right there. Um, so I put in a biopsy forceps. Um, and, uh, and, and was able to actually take a few samples uh, of that brainstem tumor from our flexible neuroendoscopy approach uh, that I did for the ETV. Um, and we were able to uh, get uh, the biopsy results from that. It was a ganglial glioma. Uh, so, uh, so we actually um, undertook a resection from there. So actually I will... Uh, I will fast forward through this part because um, this is not with the neuroendoscope, um, but really a, a, a wonderful case. Uh, we were able to get a near gross total resection of this ganglial glioma, and this patient's doing very well. So, um, for you know, in looking at endoscopy, uh, you can see I've definitely evolved in my practice over time uh, in terms of what um, I can and can't do with the uh, neuroendoscope and, and what is considered safe in my hands. Uh, I definitely would not have done some of these cases um, earlier in my career. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of the level of comfort and understanding your um, familiarity with the anatomy and your um, tools, um, I think there's really an opportunity to understand what is the best strategy for your patient, what your goals are, um, and really how do you choose the best strategy for your practice, uh, and really evolving as a field together. Um, and that's why I love uh, pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, there's such collaboration uh, around the world, uh, and, and really so much that we don't understand yet. So the last part, uh, I'd like to show um, endoscopic applications to um, epilepsy. Um, and, and this is not to convince anybody to be an epilepsy surgeon or, or to go into detail about this, but thinking about the role of endoscopy and epilepsy surgery, which will be very different than, than the beginning part of my talk. Um, so the rationale for epilepsy surgery is really 
uh, for especially in children, it is to um, is to address the detrimental effects of recurrent seizures on the developing brain, from the seizures themselves and also of the side effects of the anti-epileptic drugs, and also to try to address the um, the neurodevelopmental um, uh, price that you pay uh, with epileptic encephalopathy. So um, and to take advantage of neuroplasticity. So the goals are seizure freedom. Uh, to reduce seizure burden and to improve the quality of life. There are so many epilepsy surgeries and, and so many more being developed, and there's really an evolving role of deep brain stimulation, responsive neurostimulation, um, stereo EEG, and uh, laser ablation. So of course, I'm not going to talk about all of them. Uh, but when I talk about epilepsy surgery, uh, when I look um, at um, uh, global reported outcomes, really your, the biggest perioperative event in children is blood loss um, and blood transfusion. So, you know, that is something that we can think of in terms of, you know, can we minimize our surgical access corridor and achieve all of our goals? So let's take this through a few examples. Uh, if we do an open corpus callosotomy, this is the approach uh, typically uh, where you're interhemispheric. And then um, you can also take a laser ablation approach to the corpus callosum, where you uh, tailor your uh, trajectories to uh, try to ablate the, um, the shape of the corpus callosum. Uh, or you can do endoscopy, uh, where you can uh, verify that you can reach um, all of your uh, targets safely uh, and then, um, uh, and then um, uh, complete your callosotomy. So different approaches uh, have been compared. Um, and, uh, uh, but they're, they're really always the same anatomy and the same steps, right? So, so you need to, um, you, you need to essentially have your entire corpus callosum disconnected. And I'll show you a video of that. So when, when I look at how to apply endoscopy in epilepsy surgery, um, it can be different things, right? You can work through the working channel of the endoscope. You can use um, a port uh, where um, uh, that helps you retract the brain and you put all of your tools through the port, or you can have a three-handed technique like, like an endonasal um, uh, skull-based surgery. Uh, and that's actually the approach that I use uh, and prefer because that gives me control uh, and gives me control to be able to dissect and do uh, the, the work right next to the blood vessels and do some peel resections. Uh, it's also a much more natural learning curve. So when you look at um, uh, navigation, it, it helps you plan the craniotomy. Uh, I navigate the endoscope. Um, and then, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to see. Um, here, okay. So here is um, uh, interhemispheric. I'm looking at the corpus callosum. Now I'm dividing the corpus callosum and see that this is really, the endoscope is being held by my assistant and I'm able to use two hands with the suction and with my bipolar. So here I'm able to see my anterior cerebral artery uh, that's very clean. Um, and then here, look um, uh, back uh, to the body of the corpus callosum, uh, look along the falks and then uh, be able to look all the way back uh, to my spleenium, uh, where I can see the great veins uh, on the other side of the arachnoid. So uh, I look with postoperative uh, uh, diffusion tensor imaging for tractography to make sure as well that we've disconnected. So really, you can see I have direct visualization and control, but we're trying to minimize the um, surgical access corridor. So then um, can you bring that to hemispherotomy? Um, and when you look at the evolution of hemispherotomy, at first, really, people took out all of the, the lobes. Um, to, uh, and, and then we realized that we really didn't need to do that. We really needed to make some very key cuts. Um, and, and, uh, and you can do that from a lateral approach or a vertical approach. Now, these are the required steps, right? So if you do it open, you actually have to get into the ventricle. You have to divide the corpus callosum. Uh, divide the, the um, disconnect the mesial temporal structures, do a frontal basal disconnection, and cut through your corona radiata. So, uh, proof of concept studies were done uh, uh, on cadavers uh, by different groups. Uh, but no matter what the approach was, really, you know, these are the four cuts that you have to make. 
from laterally or vertically. So here I, I use a vertical approach um, uh, where these are the four cuts that I make uh, from an interhemispheric way. So uh, instead of doing a traditional craniotomy now, uh, I use a vertical approach that looks very much like a corpus uh, callosotomy approach. And I uh, looked at this in a cadaver study to make sure that I had proof of concept and this was feasible before actually doing it in um, a series of patients. And then really case selection is very important. Um, you, you have to set yourself up for success and choose really the, the cases that are um, much more viable for you to uh, put your instruments in and, and, um, and have that learning curve. So uh, navigating with the endoscope uh, and then um, thinking through your positioning and then looking at the ergonomics in your setup. Um, and then here. Um, I'll show you the video here. It looks just like the callosotomy, right? An interhemispheric approach. Um, and then working through the corpus callosum, getting into the ventricle. And then now this looks familiar, right? We're looking at choroid plexus, looking at the atrium. And here I'm putting a cottonoid patty into the um, uh, temporal horn, and then working around the caudate, because that I know once I go lateral to the caudate, um, and I find my temporal horn, um, I, I'm actually able to see the entire ventricular system from up top. And then um, from there, uh, I'm able to uh, do all of my disconnections, uh, including the mesial temporal disconnection, that's the hippocampus. So you can see I actually have very good visualization uh, and being able to work um, uh, from that um, uh, uh, interhemispheric approach. So postoperative DTI as well, and then, but also having backup plans, right? Just because I can use an endoscope doesn't mean it's a good idea sometimes, right? Um, so making sure that you always have the microscope on backup. Um, and uh, um, Dr. Chinale, actually, after he saw one of my talks, said, you know, why not an ultrasound? So I actually incorporated that. I have that on backup. Um, always know your anatomy, uh, don't be afraid to expand your exposure and convert to craniotomy if you need to, um, and have that as part of your backup plan. And then having that learning curve and recognizing um, the degree of comfort uh, that a surgeon needs to have, and really the, having uh, access and control to everything that you're operating on. So, um, you know, so this was my first case, um, but then uh, now uh, I, take, uh, I take on hemispheric cortical dysplasia or hemimegalencephaly or Sturge Weber. Then looking at uh, post hemispherectomy hydrocephalus, my initial series um, had about a 25% BP shunt rate, which was um, the, the same as Dr. Liu's um, global report, um, multi center report of all techniques, uh, the post hemispherectomy hydrocephalus rate. Uh, but now, um, to date, uh, my VP shunt rate is about 10%, um, but, you know, we'll see. I need more long-term follow-up. Um, uh, colleagues uh, around the world have actually taught me to modify my technique um, and make it actually more efficient. Uh, so looking at actually um, uh, Dr. Kawai and his group uh, described this modification uh, for the frontal basal disconnection. I've incorporated that uh, from the um, optic chiasm following the optic tract into the temporal horn to the choroidal point. Uh, I now do that with endoscopy. Uh, and this is an intraoperative view um, to make that frontal basal disconnection really a lot more efficient as well. Uh, I can tell you that cuts about 45 degrees, uh, 45 minutes uh, uh, from my surgeries now. So, uh, so really, you can have safe application uh, of endoscopic epilepsy surgery. Uh, the seizure outcomes uh, we've had are very favorable. Uh, from my first 35 cases, uh, we've had um, uh, only um, one patient, uh, not the uh, angle uh, one. So uh, blood loss is minimized. Um, I, I actually rarely transfuse patients now for hemispherectomy. Uh, and, and I've really seen um, very, very little in the way of post-operative fevers. So the last one I'll show is, well, if we can do that, can we do a posterior quadrant disconnection? Um, and we know the required steps here are actually to spare the motor strip, right? So actually not do a frontal lobectomy, but to disconnect the parietal 
uh, occipital and temporal lobes. So here I actually need two burr holes, uh, one um, behind the motor cortex, um, and then one uh, to allow access into the temporal horn. Uh, and this is the type of patient I would do endoscopy in. Uh, and here you can see actually has a very, very thick skull from many years of um, anti-seizure medications. So, you know, in this scenario, actually not having a large craniotomy is, is actually very helpful. Uh, and here the thick skull again. Um, but um, uh, I showed you where I put the burr hole, which is right behind the motor strip, um, to be able to do phase reversal and mapping to make sure that I'm actually behind the, the sensory motor cortex. Uh, but then here with the endoscopic views, I'm actually able to see everything that I need to. Uh, this is going to be the views from different um, approaches. Um, the one is from the, uh, the top, the, the, the parietal burr hole. And here disconnecting right next to the choroid plexus. And here you see that kind of three hand technique uh, where uh, the surgeon is actually using just microsurgical technique and the assistant is holding the endoscope. Um, and then here, um, when you look through the, the other burr hole, we're looking at the temporal horn and we're able to see that edge of the tentorium. Um, uh, and um, right there at the edge of the tentorium uh, and the uh, cranial nerve three and the posterior cerebral artery uh, on the other side of the plane. So, and that's also the edge of the tentorium right there. And here that's actually looking at the other burr hole and doing that disconnection uh, right behind sensory motor uh, and being able to have control through um, the two burr holes and then here, verifying um, our disconnection um, through the two burr holes. Then I have an EVD catheter uh, right after um, that uh, for use in the postoperative period. So uh, that's what the incisions look like uh, for the burr holes. Uh, and that's where our disconnections are. So in terms of just, you know, applications, you know, know your anatomy, like know your open surgical, microsurgical anatomy, but then be curious and think, you know, what, what is safe and, and what is feasible, but always have contingency plans. Uh, and then all use, use all your resources while you're thinking about innovation. Do you have an anatomy lab? Do you have different imaging modalities? Um, do you have surgical simulation or 3D printing? and then really collaborate and disseminate, uh, which is why I'm just honored to be able to uh, uh, speak to the um, uh, Asian um, Congress of Neurological Surgeons, because really the more colleagues we reach and have discussions with, the more we learn from each other. And then in closing, you know, epilepsy surgery is not just surgery. Um, I don't compromise on, on the anatomy or the steps. But I, I believe very, very strongly in epilepsy surgery because epilepsy surgery can maximize a child's potential um, and their quality of life. And that matters to um, patients and their families and their whole communities. So future directions, uh, I think we, I, I need to learn. I have so much more to learn. Uh, we need evolving efficiencies uh, and then really multi-center development and collaboration. So. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to share this tour of uh, expanding applications in neuroendoscopy. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor Diroko. Um, I saw that there is a question on the floor about the fluid that is used for the lysis of the interventricular uh, blood. Uh, blood uh, or clotting, you can say some things about this? Yeah, um, so, um, so I actually don't use any um, medications uh, um, or pharmacological agents to lyse the blood. So you can actually do this all under endoscopic vision. Um, the keys are to make sure that, you're, um, that you can visualize, right? So right when you go in, when your fluid um, is not clear yet, don't move the endoscope around, right? But once your fluid is clear and you can see, you can actually navigate to the blood clot um, and, and be able to suction out the blood clot. You can do that directly with a syringe um, through the working channel in your, um, in your endoscope. 
um, or you can use um, you know, different um, little ultrasonic aspirators that might fit through the endoscopic working channel. So um, whatever instruments you have at your disposal um, that's through the endoscope, you can do that. And you just directly suction out the, the, the blood clot. Usually it's not fresh, right? It, it's been there for a little bit of uh, time because the, 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 the neonate is in the neonatal ICU and you determine with a multidisciplinary discussion when is the right timing to, to uh, intervene on, on the baby. So by then the blood clot is a little bit soft and, and suckable. Um, so I, I actually personally just use the syringe, any IV syringe. Um, what, once you put your endoscope right on that blood clot, you can actually suction it out. It, it takes some time. You have to have patience, but you can actually yeah. take out a blood clot. It's true, you have to be patient. Now, I congratulate you with this presentation, not only for what you have done, but for the perspective to do more and not by only one person, but through the co cooperation around the world on, on the different strategies and the tools. I have just a question if I have time to make to you, is concern about the cerebral spinal fluid physiology, because there is a, a fashion to coagulate uh, the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus is contributing not so much in the physiology to the produ production of our cerebral spinal fluid. And nowadays, we are convinced that all the brain produce fluid. And you show the Gregor lymphatic system in one of your pictures. And I think that uh, I'm not sure that it's really necessary. And also, I think it can be harmful because chronic plexus in a physiological conditions works on both on two ways, to produce and to absorb, but also to produce substances that uh, can be necessary for the development of the brain, which is your opinion on this. I agree. Uh, I, I don't think we know the answers yet, right? And we don't know that as a field. Uh, I personally use um, cord plexus cauterization um, more sparingly. Um, so uh, uh, I, um, I actually use the ETV success score um, and, uh, and look at the multi-center retrospective um, reports from the HCRN that ETV versus ETV plus CPC, um, the success rates were actually very similar. Right. So, you know, from from that kind of multi center experience in a retrospective way, they were not able to show that CPC actually conferred added success. So so in my view, um, I, I don't do ETV CPC on everybody. Um, I, I, uh, I use it in, in instances where um, uh, where, where only in a neonate, uh, only in a baby, um, if I feel um, like we need something extra, uh, or if it's a redo setting where they've already failed in ETV, um, and, uh, and I, I, I don't believe in doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So, um, but there is a, a, a randomized controlled trial um, uh, coming up uh, with the HCRN uh, to really look at the role of uh, ETV CPC. And I think that is the type of uh, uh, high quality data that we're all gonna be looking very um, uh, anxiously for. But I agree with you. Um, we, we should think about the consequences of the anatomy and what we're doing. Second question can be about the application of endoscopy to epilepsy surgery. And your data were quite impressive. And this you can do, uh, you can transform a severe procedure in a tedious, should be patients, long procedures, but with some kind of benefit for the child. I agree with you and I'm curious to see how much this uh, technique can be expanded. One criticism that the adult neurosurgeons do to us is that when you have a, a kind of complications and uh, like an abrupt in, intracranial hemorrhage, if you are not trained to do open neurosurgery, how you can react, how in the future uh, 
surgeons that have the most are confident in endoscopy and can deal with this kind of complications. I agree with you, um, uh, which is why um, uh, being very familiar with open surgery first um, it is actually really important. And I, I, I wonder what that means for the future of neurosurgical training, right? So I, I feel like I, um, uh, I'm very lucky in that I trained in the generation where everything was open, was maximally invasive. Um, and, uh, and I benefited from, from that, right? So I trained at a vascular heavy program uh, that did a lot of micro, um, uh, micro neurosurgery uh, uh, with Neil Martin. And then, um, and then also with Itzhak Fried, uh, who was really pushing the limits with epilepsy um, research and epilepsy surgery and Gary Mathern uh, to think about um, uh, the anatomy in hemispherectomy. But since I saw everything open and big, uh, and, and then now I have the endoscope, um, you know, how do you respect that? You know, how, how do you, how do you apply your knowledge of anatomy and see if you can um, take that benefit of that knowledge and vision, um, but try to benefit the patient so that they don't have to be maximally exposed, but they have the, ma the, the maximally effective surgery, right? So now if I can see everything and reach everything, and I have my two hands that I can actually effectively do all of the disconnections with no compromises, then I, I think that that's that that's how we kind of make that leap, um, and that that wasn't a leap; that was an evolution, right? Um, so I, I I got the big open experience and the endoscopic application, but then when as we train the younger generation, how do they get the big open experience and the confidence before they're able to do the the minimally invasive? Um, and, and I think that that's where we need to get creative with uh, with training. Um, where um, you know, do we have a a more global view of training? Where where there are centers that are very good at open approaches and centers that do more endoscopic, but you have to see the open first, or is it um, a cadaveric dissection? Right. So the 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 courses, the places that have uh, very good anatomy labs uh, with dissection, um, really get very familiar with dissection, um, the anatomy, white matter dissection, and knowing where everything is. Uh, and then um, using simulation and then 3D printing to be able to help teach um, teach our trainees uh, and, uh, and also augmented reality. I can say I, I did not quite grow up in that era. So, you know, the, the video games and, and all of those things are, are a little bit less natural to me. But I think to the digital native generation uh, that we are training now, that will be very natural to them. So, you know, how do we incorporate that um, and teach them, you know, give them actually um, uh, uh, simulations, uh, realistic looking simulations of complications and, and teach them to, to, uh, to deal with that, just like we had to live through that ourselves. Is there a way that we can teach people without them having to live through that themselves? So but that's a very interesting question, but also always safety first and, and really our duty and responsibilities to the patients first. Uh, the last question, and I'll leave you free. Uh, it's about the complication of hemispherectomy. We have one known complication, the hydrocephalus. So the question is if you have a low rate with an endoscopic. The second question concerns fever. This is, this is a strange reaction that I never understood why, if it is less with an endoscopic technique compared to the open technique. It is um, uh, very much so. I used to tell all families, you are going to have fevers. You're going to have fevers for a week. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we have a way we will, you know, pan culture everything, the CSF blood cultures, everything. And, and uh, they get the stiff neck. Um, but, uh, but I noticed that, that my endoscopic patients actually don't have fevers. Um, and, um, and then the families think I'm lying to them that they're going to have fevers. But, but now I've changed my approach. I said, you may have fevers. Um, and I used to see that a lot, but I actually don't see that um, uh, now. Um, and, and I don't know if, if it's actually, um, if it's actually um, that 
the, the cordisectomy, right? The, if, if you're doing a lateral or vertical approach um, and you're actually going through brain tissue to get to the ventricular system, that, that's, that spillage uh, of, um, uh, of any type of um, inflammatory mark, uh, markers um, uh, would actually cause uh, a, a, a aseptic or sterile meningitis, right? That that um, will will just give you kind of blood blood products, TNF, interleukins, that will just kind of help, just just um, give you a central fever, right? So now you can see I I go interhemispheric, right? So interhemispheric, and then I'm in the ventricular system, and I do the whole surgery through the ventricular system. Um, then I come back out. So I really don't cut through brain tissue like, like I would in an open approach. And I wonder if that's why I'm not seeing the, those post-op fevers like I used to in the open approach. Um, and I, I, don't, um, I don't know that answer yet. And I, I was hoping that will kind of reflect out in the post-hemispherectomy hydrocephalus outcomes too. But um, I just need to keep track and collaborate. And I'm actually looking for labs uh, to analyze the CSF to see what is it um, in, in that. Um, so so that, that is uh, to be answered, but very interesting. In the open, you have a relation with the age. The complication of hydrocephalus is a lot more frequent in very young children than in, in older children. Okay, thank you very much. It was very impressive. And I thank you and the organizer for this opportunity. I hope that will people Enjoy your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sandy Lam and Professor Diroku. It was indeed a wonderful session. We can always just sit back and admire and applause for the wonderful work you have been doing. One question that I would like to put uh, forward to you is, uh, what is the surveillance like, post-ETV surveillance in these children? How often do you call and what is the main criteria that you follow except for other than head circumferences? Uh, so children with open fontanelles, uh, it's uh, with ultrasound. Uh, if it's closed fontanelles, uh, then with uh, either a low dose uh, uh, radiation, uh, low dose radiation CT scan, uh, or um, MR uh, uh, quick MR scans that are targeted at the ventricular system. So here we we do the MR, the fast MR. Um, but usually it's a, a head circumference, uh, you put it on the Grove chart, and then um, th uh, definitely a three month scan, uh, and then three months, six months, 12 months, and then yearly from there. Thank you, thank you very much. Another question I would like to put forward is, what about post resection cases where they develop hydrocephalus? Uh, like they may be having uh, this for a short period, which may or may not go away with the temporizing uh, diversion, temporary diversion uh, procedure. So how do you decide whether would you like to temporize it? And is it only the symptoms, clinical symptoms or uh, radiological or any other criteria you have in like post medulloblastoma as you operate patient still has some ventricular dilation which may per persist or may go away after some days. What is, is there any criteria that you follow? Um, no, so, so you're talking in the context of posterior fossa tumors, yes. you'll have uh, hydrocephalus afterwards. So uh, no, and you know, the, the literature um, is uh, varied in that, right? So you have uh, the group in um, Paris uh, advocating for ETV upfront for everybody. Um, then you have some groups um, uh, um, uh, advocating for um, management in other ways, like uh, EVD um, after, you know, during the time of the surgery and afterwards and weaning that external ventricular drain. And then after you wean it, um, if you still, if you need intervention, then would you do an ETV or a shunt, right? So my, my group tends to uh, favor ETV, um, but then you, you uh, yes, you look at the clinical symptoms for clinical symptoms of hydrocephalus, but you also have a, a pseudomeningocele uh, from your posterior fossa resection uh, that will usually give you an indication as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can take one last question from my co-host, Liu Bunsen, before we move on to the second session. Liu? Thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor, uh, for a very nice talk. Uh, Professor, I, I, I want to ask you uh, regarding the IVH, uh, does the volume of the hemorrhage matter that uh, determine our treatment 
and also uh, prognostication the needs of a uh, shunt? If so, how do you calculate the volume of the uh, uh, blood in the ventricle? My last question, Professor, one extra question regarding the study done by Professor Waf uh, in Uganda. And he found that a uh, baby below six months old uh, tend to have failed ETV. Uh, till now, uh, does anybody have the answer why that's so? Thank you, Prof. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so the, the first question was um, uh, volume uh, of the hemorrhage. Um, so uh, um, we, uh, we, we don't use uh, criteria for volume of the hemorrhage. We, we use uh, just go purely on the grading scale um, of grade three or grade four, um, and then follow the amount of ventricular dilatation. Uh, and you'll see um, uh, uh, if it is, uh, uh, if, and then also the measurements, frontal occipital horn ratio, and you can use ventricular index or you know what your center uses. Uh, the HCRN uses frontal occipital horn ratio in, in their studies, so we adopted that. Um, so, um, so, so once you see that ratio start enlarging, um, that uh, and you have other clinical criteria, bulging fontanelles, blade sutures, uh, apneas and bradycardias are, are much later. So we usually, we, we try not to wait for that. We, we just really look for that hint that we're moving towards hydrocephalus. Um, so, so the clot part doesn't matter, or, or we don't know how to quantify the clot in terms of um, outcomes on uh, impact on our timing of surgical intervention or the outcomes, right? So then our goal in surgery is to remove the clot, right? So, um, uh, and then what else? Um, but if you were to do that, uh, you, you could do, um, now there's uh, free access to volumetric software. Right. So, you know, we, we used to, you know, like actually um, just try to do the maximal uh, width and the maximal length and maximal height uh, and then divide it. But but really now you can just run it through your volumetric software. Right. So um, like Brain Lab or Stealth um, or uh, your radiologists uh, uh, have that. So um, the other um, uh, the other question um, why does ETV fail in less than six months? Why the ETV failure? We don't know yet, right? Um, I, I think there, there's theories. Um, the, the theories, uh, you, you know, could be actually um, uh, the, the role of pulsations and pulsatility. Um, uh, and, and also, I guess, that, that fontanelle being open, right? So it, is there something that, that is not really... Um, I guess forcing that that CSF to use that stoma that you created, right? So is is the whole system because it's it's a uh, open um, and, and kind of more cartilaginous? Uh, it does that uh, is that different than a closed fused skull and fontanelle, right? Um, also, uh, so I, I think that from from a uh, physics standpoint uh, and hydrodynamic standpoints kind of makes the most sense to me. Um, and then the other um, that, that I don't think is quantified is, is just healing potential and healing rate uh, of, of a newborn versus an adult, right? I mean, we've seen that in wound healing for all of our patients, right? So um, if there's something that's really not driving CSF through that stoma and that is scarring over, is that just going to scar over faster and easier in, in a very, very young child as well? Dr. DiRocco, do you have other thoughts to that? No, this is one explanation, and I agree. The other is that the physiology of the capillaries changes with age. In the first six months, they don't absorb so well like in the adult. So maybe we have a combination of a minor push force that the child is lying down almost all day, so you don't have this. And the second is the physiology of the brain that is changing. Thank, Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. So with that, we'll close the first session. And I sincerely thank both the speaker and chair, Prof. Sandy Lamb, Prof. Kansis Udiruko, for this wonderful talk and the discussion that followed. I would like to inform our viewers that currently this has been broadcast on WeChat, YouTube, and Zoom. And as of now, we have 1,075 people who have joined us live from all over the world. We are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. 
So I would like to invite Professor Kasuhira Hongo to say a short introduction and invite the second speaker, Professor Sebastian Lea. Professor Hongo, all yours. Yes, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm really pleased to chair the session titled Microsurgical Treatment of the Palakline Organism by Professor Sebastian Leal. Uh, there are various types of anism in the Palakline region, such as blister anism, culted cave anism, dissecting anism, large or giant anism, and so on. And nowadays, uh, as the endovascular treatment is rapidly advancing, a treatment strategy of the plaque line of anism of the internal culted artery has been changed uh, remarkably. Anism of this region is usually uh, a good indication for uh, the endovascular treatment of this. However, I think not all these anism can be treated uh, by endovascular treatment, including coiling, stenting, and also for diverter. Direct surgery uh, for the palacoline anisms, anism remains an important treatment option. As for the direct surgery, there are very, various issues uh, to be considered, including indication of the surgical treatment, the surgical techniques, ways of uh, avoiding complications, and so on. Microsurgical anatomy is also quite essential to complete the procedure safely and accurately. And how to deal with antrochnine process, optic slat, uh, distal drilling, and also how to select suitable clips, preparatives itself, and so on. Now today we have uh, an expert session on this area. Now I'd like to invite Professor Sebastian Leal. Uh, start the lecture, please. Uh, okay, dear colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night. And thanks for uh, Professor Hongo's uh, introduction. And thank uh, the president of ACNS, Professor Kato, Dr. Rogers, invitation to this uh, ACNS webinar. And it's an honor for me to speak about the uh, microsurgical treatment of the paraclinoid aneurysm. And this is not a, a review of the literature. Actually, uh, this is only a story about the journey I had in learning how to deal with the uh, paraclinoid aneurysm. And um, I have uh, nothing to disclose. Uh, uh, this is me and I have a passion in cycling. And it's a pure uh, mix joy and pain in pedaling up a difficult uh, slope or mountain, just like being a neurosurgeon. And I had my uh, training from uh, 2009 to 2015 in Taipei Veterans General Hospital, Taiwan. And during these years, I've been the uh, once main topic moderator in uh, 2017 WM. FNS meeting in Istanbul and helped as a table instructor in dissection courses. And this is uh, my main um, publication, a uh, complication of the effectiveness of using the optic strut and tuberculon cella as a radiological landmarks in diagnosing paraclinoid aneurysms with CT angiography. And uh, which is also the first part of my talk today because uh, diagnosis in, is important. And I will uh, talk about how this idea came to my mind and how I answered my own question in diagnosing the uh, paraclinoid aneurysm. And this is uh, uh, my mentor, Sanfer. And I have to thank him because I learned so much from him. He has a vision of providing world-class dissection courses to uh, Taiwan's neurosurgical trainings. And he invited masters around the world to uh, come to Taiwan to teach and share their views. Like uh, Professor Yoshikyo and Professor Ture for fiber dissection and Professor Evandro and Professor Krish for AVM, aneurysm and skull-based dissection. And Professor Evandro scolded me 
uh, one or twice when I was not paying attention to his lecture. And he's now looking at us in heaven. So um, in my training days, I attended every year the courses as long as I can. And as a, a question came to my mind finally in my last year of training, and how do I diagnose this paraclinoid aneurysms correctly, intradural or extradural? At that time, I drew a paraclinoid aneurysm on the blackboard in class and asked the teachers the same question as I ask you right now. Um, are these uh, on the right one? Are these uh, intradural or extradural? And everyone has his opinion when and looking at this uh, DSA uh, uh, pictures. So actually the right one is extradural. And this middle one, we use, sometimes we use ophthalmic artery to, to help diagnosing the aneurysm, but uh, it's not um, usually correct. And this one is, the middle one is also extradural. And the left one is an, a transitional uh, paraclinoid aneurysm, which means uh, it's half in, half out. The dural ring is at the aneurysm's waist. So I ask myself a question, uh, which structure can be our ref reference point to, um, to predict the dural ring, where the dural ring is. Can we use these bony structures to, to help us diagnose the paraclinoid aneurysm? And I found in the literature, MRI has been the, uh, the tool used to determine where the dural ring is. However, um, its uh, validity and uh, feasibility is of question because a special sequences or protocol has to be used. So uh, finally, I, I choose the CTA angiography as the uh, diagnostic tool because in a uh, in a emergency setting, we use uh, CTA as the uh, as our first diagnostic tool uh, rather than MRI because it's a uh, uh, time wasting and sometimes you have to uh, need the technician to to operate the MRI. So uh, CTAs is my, uh, was my choice. Then as to the reference point, I choose the uh, tuberculum cella and the uptick strut as my uh, bony landmark. So uh, uh, from January 2010 to September uh, 2013, I retrieved uh, from the logbook, OP logbook, uh, 49, surgical patients who were diagnosed with uh, paraclinoid aneurysms. And I reviewed the CTA and DSA and operative videos. All of this, because uh, during this period, I, I was still um, a trainee. And then these patients are all uh, from uh, my mentor, Sanford's, Dr. Sanford's case. And how, how did I uh, measure it? You can imagine one aneurysmal neck has one proximal and one distal points along the ICA. And there are three types of the paraclinoid aneurysm, intradural, transitional, or extradural. Uh, for example, if I use the, the base, the base of the optic strut as the reference point, which means I presumed the uh, dura ring is at the level of the base of the optic strut. I um, designate it as uh, zero millimeter. If the proximal point, the uh, proximal point of the aneurysmal neck is uh, three millimeter below the optic strut, it's then I write it uh, minus three millimeter. If the distal point is a uh, five millimeter, a point, the optic strut is a uh, plus five. And then this is, uh, a transitional paraclinoid aneurysm. So uh, let me show you an example. This aneurysm, a CTA and DSA. And in the uh, workstation, we can examine the, uh, the source image of the, the CTA. The 
the 2A is the actual cut and the yellow arrow shows the proximal aneurysmal neck. And this is the uh, sagittal cut, the proximal neck is here. And because it uh, has the uh, 3D correlation, it's reconstructed. So this red line equals to the coronal cut as here. The uh, proximal neck, the height of the proxim proximal neck is here. So if I, the, the base of the optic strut is uh, as reference, the proximal neck is five millimeter above the optic strut. If I set the tuberculum cella as the reference point, the, proxi the proximal neck point is at the tuberculum cella, so it's uh, zero. And that's my idea. Then I will compare it with the actual uh, actual OP uh, finding. This is the dual ring and the aneurysm is here. So the aneurysm is actually intradural one. And after examining all these uh, patients, I have I used the uh, uh, linear regression, the Cohen's kappa, and to evaluate this uh, diagnosis, the accuracy of the diagnosis. And the demographic of the patients are here and the type of paraclinoid aneurysm, 12 are medial type, eight are anterior type, two are lateral and eight are posterior type. The intraoperative findings, there are 12 intradural uh, aneurysm, 12 transitional and six extradural. And let us uh, look at this table. Um, Uh, here, if we take the tuberculum cella as reference point, we have the uh, proximal neck and distal neck. If all are minus, if the value is minus, it means it's extra dural. And so we got uh, all this data here. And on the right side, we use the optic strut as the reference point. We can also got all this data and to help us uh, diagnose uh, pre-op. We, we can make a pre-op diagnosis of this paraclinoid aneurysm, then compare it with the intraoperative finding. Then after using this method, we can uh, see that both of the optic strut and the tuberculum cella has a good correlation. However, uh, the kappa, Cohen's kappa, uh, the optic strut is far superior to the tu tuberculum cella. You can see the, the last table. Uh, most of the, if you use the tuberculum cella as the reference point, most of the pre-op diagnosis are extra dural type. And if you use the uh, optic strut as the reference point, re the pre-op diagnosis more compatible with the intra-op diagnosis. But linear regression did not show this. It's uh, interator reliability. Cohen's kappa show the, uh, the validity of the optic strut. So it means that the dura ring is uh, more close. The, the, the height, the position, the is more close to the base of the optic strut. But the incidence has been observed that uh, overestimating of the intradural portion of the paraclinoid uh, when using the optic strut base as a reference point. You can see that uh, in these three, these are overestimating uh, the intradural portion. On the upper, this is the definitive diagnosis, extradura, transdura, intradura, the pre-op diagnosis using the uh, base of the optic strut. So uh, the optic strut has the tendency to overestimate the intradural portion. So how do I uh, deal with this um, result? Uh, we use the ROC curve to uh, estimate 
uh, where the uh, distal dura ring might be. So this is the, the result. The distal dura ring is about two millimeter above the base of the optic strut. The sensitivity and specificity is, is quite nice. So the uh, diagnosis of the paraclinoid aneurysm is that uh, CTA sources imaging is effective. And if you use the uh, base of the optic strut, it is effective, but the presumed distal dural ring is two millimeter above the uh, base of the optic strut. And that's how I answered my own question. And so this finding is uh, published in a uh, journal of neurosurgery in 2016. And then that's, um, that's the uh, experience I get from my mentor, Sanford. And now what, what about me? I, I had uh, my own uh, cases and I share the surgical video here. It's uh, uh, I used, we all use the uh, pretemporal transclinoid approach or transcavernous approach. Uh, basically it's a the length approach for the aneurysm. And this is a 54 year old female had an incidental finding of um, right paraclinoid aneurysm. It's here. And this is the uh, pre-op CDA. You can see this paraclinoid aneurysm. Actually, there are two. One is the small one and a larger one. So what's the diagnosis? I think this is a, a pretty easy one. So it's an intradural one. We can see the um, CTA. This is the usual CTA we use in our clinical setting. It's a one millimeter uh, slice. So the base of the optic strut is here. The, the, blue, the blue arrow pointed at here. And going up, the base of optic strut plus one millimeter, we start to see there is a small aneurysm. And then going up, this uh, uh, place where the presumed distal dura ring lies. So we see the, uh, this small aneurysm and now the bigger one. And here is the neck of the bigger paraclinoid aneurysm. So obviously this one is intradural one. Then how about the small one? Because the, uh, the dura ring is a, a slope uh, from uh, downwardly sloping uh, toward the midline. So I think it's an, also an intradural one. So the diagnosis is a, a right paraclinoid aneurysm. The neck is about 0.6 centimeter. The dome is 1.2 with posterior projection. And the other one is a right carotid cave aneurysm. So the treatment choices, right? Just as uh, Professor Hongo's uh, introduction, we are new, we neurosurgeon now facing the end, endovascular intervention, uh, whether it's coiling or flow diverter. But uh, after I discuss uh, with the patient about the treatment choices, uh, the patient uh, choose to have this surgery. So during the surgery, uh, we have to cut the distal dural ring and mobilize the ICA to facilitate clipping because uh, if we don't uh, cut the distal dural ring, the, uh, most of the time, the clip will uh, pinch on the uh, dural ring and you cannot advance the clip to include the whole aneurysm neck. And the next one is to avoid uh, injury to the optic nerve and ophthalmic artery. In this case, we have to use fenestrated clips to finish the clip. And because it's in the backside of our surgical view. And uh, clip, check the clip position 
ICA patency via intraoperative DSA. This is my uh, surgical uh, rationale. And there's one tumor here, small uh, carotid cave aneurysm and one posterior type. And because uh, uh, after I finished my training, I went to Taichung Veterans General Hospital. There's a hybrid OR and this is a first generation one. I had my uh, operation and I do the DSA myself intraoperatively to check the uh, aneurysm clip. Then I finished the operation. So this is the, the surgical video. It's uh, done in uh, 2018 and the recording was not so, uh, the quality was not so good. I'm sorry for that. And this is the right side frontal temporal. We drill flat the uh, sphenoid ridge and open the optic canal. This is the ACP. And peel the, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Uh, this is a basic the length approach. After peeling the, cabinet, the lateral wall of the cabinet sinus, we can expose the ACP and do the extradural anterior clinoidectomy and drill the ACP and optic strut, the optic nerve, ICA is right here, optic strut. And remove the ACP. Then we open the dura and cut the falciform ligament to avoid impinge of the optic nerve to the falciform ligament. And there's some remaining of the optic strut, so I cut it out and cut the distal dura ring for further mobilization. This is the clinoid ICA. Here is supraclinoid ICA. This is optic nerve. The PCP, the third nerve, ICA, any reason. And I check the the aneurysmal neck. I choose this case because uh, uh, this is the uh, of this is the uh, second or third paraclinoid aneurysm I clipped. I choose this one because I did it uh, because the type I used the uh, fenestrated clip. They it got two aneurysms. I did the uh, intraop DSA is a like a, um, it has some meaning to me, so I choose this one. Although the recording quality is not so good. So I used two fenestrated clip and check the residual neck. During this operation, uh, the uh, retractor is not needed. This is the only space I, I need to uh, finish the clipping. And I back the clip a little bit. And I did the intraop DSA. You can see uh, I missed the carotid cave aneurysm. Why? Because I did not uh, cut the distal dura ring uh, circumferen. Uh, cut the cut it circumferentially. I mean, uh, the whole ring should be released. Then I can place and clip. So I mobilize. This is the ophthalmic artery. This the medial side of the uh, dural ring. I cut it all open. and the carotid cave aneurysm is here. The ring is here. If I don't cut the ring open, I cannot advance the clip. Then I place the third clip 
across across the level of this total ring and preserve the ophthalmic artery. And check the clip position. Then this is the intra-op DSA. I uh, complete up, obliterate the aneurysm and uh, maintain the flow. Then I cut open the, the aneurysm to check it. I still put some, uh, uh, do some wrapping. This is the uh, post-op view. And this is one year post-op CTA, the fenestrate, three fenestrated clip. And this is my first case. And the second case is for uh, all of you. And because I have a question to ask, uh, and I want to hear your uh, opinion. This one is a compressive optic neuropathy caused by a flow diverter, occluded but still growing supraclinoid aneurysm. Uh, this is the uh, pre-TEA, pre-TAE DSA. It's a very uh, large aneurysm. And this is the 3D reconstruction. And the patient had uh, the uh, pipeline deployment uh, in 2019. And this is immediate uh, post-TAE view. There's some stagnation of the contrast. And this is the thin cut. The, up, uh, the aneurysm was occluded by the uh, pipeline and the follow-up DSA showed no aneurysm. However, uh, the patient uh, got a visual deterioration six months after the, uh, the pipeline placement. And nine months post TAE, you can see the aneurysm is still growing. Despite that the, on DSA, there's no uh, flow going into the aneurysm. And this is the operative view. Uh, the case belongs to uh, my senior colleagues and I did the operation for him. This is the uh, distal dura ring. The aneurysm is a, a large one. ICA is here and the optic nerve is here. On the right side, you can see the, the, the grid of the pipeline, the grid is, um, very obvious. We are, uh, okay, there's a surgical video. I can, I can skip a little because of the time. I cut the falciform ligament and the same, this time I, I cut the uh, distal dura ring on the, me on the medial side, this is the uh, a cella. Because I know if I have to place the clip, I need to open it thoroughly. And here we'll see the third nerve is over here. The third nerve is here. I open the ocular motor triangle and uh, where it leads to the cavernous sinus. This is the posterior aspect of the distal dura ring. I can uh, put the instrument through and check it here. So I 
I got the all the dual ring cut and I can mobilize the uh, ICA. Uh, this is the optic nerve. And you can see the pipeline through the vessel. The pipeline is here. And after I did all this dissection, I, uh, I did the uh, optic nerve decompression and I opened the uh, dural ring. And finally, I discussed with my senior colleagues uh, because this is uh, his patient, he doesn't want to have a clip here because uh, he, he was afraid that I will uh, crush the wall or I will compromise the pipeline to make the wall narrowing. So uh, finally, we, we did the compression and coagulation of the, the aneurysm wall, aneurysm wall. So, and you can see three months post-operatively, -oper the MRI showed a regression, shrinkage of the aneurysm. And the patient's, the patient's visual field improved uh, three months post-op, nine months post-op. So um, this is a case that intrigues me. And I uh, also want to ask your uh, opinion about this. So uh, discussion and conclusion, the, the presumed uh, this total ring is about two millimeter above the, uh, the base of the optic strut. If you use the CDA angiography uh, as the diagnostic tool and the, the pretemporal transclinoid tr or transcavenous approach is, um, uh, makes us to uh, easily mobilize the ICA and cut the dura ring and uh, which facilitate us to put the clip uh, into the right position, yeah, to deal with the paraclinoid aneurysm, especially when it involves the ring. And this is the question I want to ask. Clipping after pipeline placement, anyone has uh, experience or some opinion about this? I don't know. And thank you. This is my, uh, this is my talk. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Yao, for a very nice, impressive uh, presentation. Well, uh, there are two parts. One part, uh, you presented us the uh, research work on how to diagnose uh, yeah. the anisomatic interdural or extradural based on uh, from your result, from your result CTA. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Optic slot is the good landmark rather than tuberculum cell. And the latter part, there are two interesting cases. Well, uh, first, well, uh, first I, I, I have a couple of questions and comments for <clears throat> regarding the uh, reference tuberculum cell and optic slot. I think your result is quite reasonable the uh, topic slot is uh, more a uh, good landmark for uh, the reference. Because I think Turukum Sere uh, has a large uh, variation depending on the, the patient. Sometimes it's big and sometimes uh, not well developed. So, but topic slot is, uh, I don't think there is much. Uh, uh, variation. It's very anatomically. It's close, very close to the calcate artery, and then yes. uh, uh, draw uh, this drawing. I think uh, your result is quite reasonable. And <clears throat> well, uh, and you do interoperative DSA. Ah, uh, uh, any comments? Uh, regarding my uh, comment, uh, 
and optic slot. Uh, uh, I, uh, when I did this uh, uh research, I I have um read some articles about the uh, diagnosis, uh, the cavernous uh ICA aneurysm, and um. They all you also use the uh, uh, CTA as the diagnostic tool, but they did not uh, compare the uh, intraoperative finding and the uh, and to confirm it with the uh, the uh, landmark. So the validity of that uh, study is not so uh, so good. So I did this one and. Um, I think it's uh, uh, useful for me, yeah, clinically. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you, you do uh, intraoperative DSA because you have a good facility at the Seagull I can use. And <clears throat> now how about the ICGP angiography? And uh, also you, do you use, of course? Yes, I use that, but <clears throat> because these uh, aneurysms are, uh, uh, in the back, uh, from our surgical view, is uh, at mm. the back of the uh, Usually you cannot uh, ICA. See the yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. You you cannot see uh, uh, from the ICG. So uh, I use the intraoperative DSA mm. to deal and with how, this. How often? How often do you do intraoperative DSA? Uh, uh, just one or step by step? Uh, it's uh nearly the uh standard uh procedure uh when i uh, do the paraclinoid aneurysm but mm -hmm. it, just like uh, professor hongo mentioned if uh, i can use icg to see the aneurysm uh where to decide whether it is complete operated obliterated i i only use icg yeah yes well and before going to the two cases. Uh, the first case you did, uh, you found the cavernism and uh, remained unclipped. Uh, you found intraoperatively by DSA. I think yeah. uh, circumferential dissection of this building is quite essential. Yeah, as you mentioned, otherwise, uh, even small aneurysm at the, uh, by cutting the circumferential cutting, the grip blades can be advanced. Otherwise, yeah. cannot be gripped uh, by even by dissecting, cutting the uh, the drilling, but you cannot directly see the naked self of the cutted cave aneurysm. But uh, uh, it's uh, quite essential to cut the this other link circumferentially to advance the grip. Yes, and I yes. think. Uh... Yeah. If we cut the uh, distal dural ring uh, circumferentially, <laughs> we can mobilize the ICA as long as the patient's uh, vessel quality is good. If the mm -hmm. it's uh, cause the calcification or it's very hard, it's sometimes it is uh, hard to push the ICA mm -hmm. or mobilize the ICA to see the backside of it to identify where the uh, carotid cave uh, aneurysm mm -hmm. is. So I think uh, the patient's uh, vessel wall condition is also also um, had a part in it. Okay, and I'd like to confirm that, how about the proximal cervical control? Do you do uh, cervical? Uh, uh, no, 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 because in this approach, we can have a proximal control uh, uh, by this approach. And if we, uh, we need more proximal control. We can open the uh, Parkinson's triangle to uh, secure the cavernous ICA. So we don't have to open the neck. Uh, before before dealing with the anticline process and optic slides. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. And the second case, very interesting. It's a yeah. very tough, difficult. Well, for me, uh, I do not have any experience of uh, doing endovascular procedure by myself, but the, uh, in my institute a couple of years ago, we had 
and started to do pipeline placement for thy butter. But the, I, I have uh, no uh, good answer for your question. Uh, scraping <laughs> possible after pipeline placement, but I think the case uh, before uh, the selection of pipeline or creeping, uh, uh, didn't you think it, it's uh, creepable or not before starting the initial treatment? Yeah, yes, I, I think the case is uh, clippable, clippable. But the patient mm. choose to have a pipeline, so uh, that's that's the patient's choice. Yes. And well, uh, for me, I think uh, the, I, I think it's a grippable because uh, neck is not uh, big. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. the pipeline is also uh, one option right now. And yeah. well, uh, you said that the six months after pipeline placement, the yeah. visual visas uh, deteriorated. Yes, yes. Uh, what, what's the mechanism? It's uh, embolized, but it's still at the patency, the anism patent and uh, gradually grow. That yes, is the... We, yes, the, uh, the aneurysm was occluded by the pipeline, but it's still yes. growing. And we think it's because mm. the, the vessel vessorum is still uh, supplying oh, the vessel wall, mm -hmm. the the nutrients, so the the aneurysm is still mm -hmm. growing. Yeah. And at the second uh, time, uh, the endotelic surgery, you did just the coagulation of the uh, aneurysm, not press uh, creeping, creep. No, uh, yes, you only just, just only coagulation, only coagulation to, the, uh, to decompress from the optic nerve, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's a uh, interesting case. We just only coagulate the, mm -hmm. the aneurysm wall as much as I can see. And we uh, open the optic canal and cut the falciform ligament to decompress the optic nerve. So that's what we do. We, I did not uh, clip it. I did not. Well, uh, during coagulation of the aneurysm, uh, yeah. And how about the intramural uh, anismal pressure? Usually, when we do coagulation of the anism itself, uh, blood pressure should be raised uh, down, uh, lowered, or temporarily placed proximally. Otherwise, uh, when coagulating the anism, it's, I think, uh, easy to rupture. But of course, it depends, uh, depending on the thickness of the the neck, wall, yeah, the but because wall. this aneurysm is already uh, excluded from the circulation, so but still the aneurysm is growing gradually. It means the flow flow persisted, right? Uh, if but, it is occluded from the separated from the floor, then and what is the reason for growing, compressing the optic nerve? Yes, so that, I, that's why we, we think it's the uh, vessel vessorum uh, uh, oh, giving vessel, the vessel. nutrients I, to the, uh, the wall of the... Yeah, and in the aneurysm, it's only a clot, uh -huh. the blood clot, yeah. So <laughs> in for uh, based on the explanation, I think just coagulation is good because... Uh, by coagulation, uh, the flow of vasovasorum, it must be not very thin, and coagulation uh, is good enough. But I think uh, for that case, creeping, creep placement is possible. Uh, yeah, I, even that uh, stage. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd like I, to have uh, <laughs> I argue with my uh, senior uh -huh. colleagues too about this, but uh, he thinks that is probably safer not to clip uh, because uh, yes. if the uh, the pipeline was compressed by the clip uh, there's uh, no yes. flow in the ICA mm -hmm. the patient would be it will be devastating to the patient mm -hmm. well uh, well how about procedure any any comment uh, on, on this uh, 
proven case, second case. Yeah. Yeah, Ask, asking me, Prof? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I see, hello. Yeah, I, I see that uh, the electricity is safe as long as we put our clip far away from the pipeline, we said, because the advantage putting a pipeline is it, it, none of the uh, uh, material is within the aneurysm sac. And as you say that it may, may have already, uh, do not have flow from the main artery, probably is, is safer, to, is probably I do not know, probably is safe to have a proximal control in the neck in case then you can open up, take out the clot, and you can see clearly where you apply your clip and you do not uh, obliterate the, the pipeline, I think. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, anyway, I think it's quite interesting case, cases. And I'm very impressed with your basic uh, analysis of how to di uh, diagnose. Well, uh, how about the there, Russia? Any? That, yeah, there is one uh, actually. Uh, what I would have tried was I would have attempted a retrograde suction decompression for that. If it is if the aneurysm is showing flow on DSA, a retrograde suction de decompression would have been a good option. And if, uh, as uh, Professor Liao said, that the senior colleagues were worried if you put a temporary clip on the pipeline, embol, uh, pipeline device that it would shrink. I would like to say that if it was an enterprise stent or a uh, neuroform atlas, you can actually well put a temporary clip. And if you remove the temporary clip, the stent would expand. This is a study done by Professor Pascal Jabbar Professor Jabbar gave this lecture uh, in our past webinar. Professor Liao, if he is interested, can definitely view that webinar about, about uh, hybrid option for para, for aneurysms then given by Prof. Professor Pascal Jabbar. So that mm -hmm. is my yeah. opinion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I want to confirm that you say if that's an enterprise a stand you can clip it you can clip if you remove the clip it will again expand oh really how oh, magical <laughs> that this was that told by professor pascal jabbar in one of the webinars okay right. well uh professor Lajas said mentioned yeah uh suction decompression uh, as a first uh treatment is one good option uh when clipping press press clip paste Yes. Uh, well, well, we have today Professor yeah. Hidehito Kimura with us. Professor Kimura, can you hear us? <laughs> yeah. That, yes, please you, give your oh. esteemed comments. Yeah. <laughs> no, nice to, ah, hello. Uh, hello, nice, uh, nice to hear, Raja, and uh, nice to hear to see you, Professor Hongo. Uh, I'm Hidehito Kimura. So I also enjoyed a lot the lecture regarding the uh, paraclinal aneurysm. So, I'm so impressed uh, to hear the uh, second case. The after the pipeline, the aneurysm was uh, successfully treated by just coagulate the aneurysm wall, not to not to not need to perform the additional clip. Of course, in my in my opinion, when I first time see your your presentation, I if I do that case, I will treat the patient and trap and the high flow bypass. Maybe there are uh, traditional uh, option to the, this kind of aneurysm treatment. However, today I noticed just coagulate the aneurysm wall can be uh, maybe the one of the treatment option for the uh, enlargement aneurysm after the flow diversion. Yeah, it's a good option. But mm -hmm. so I my my comment is uh, some aneurysm maybe. Uh, re enlarge after the flow diverter, especially especially in the located in the posterior fossa. So some huge uh, VA aneurysm can be treated recently flow diversion diverter. But in such a case, aneurysm enlarged, we cannot coagulate the aneurysm wall because the aneurysm wall attached to the brain stem already. So in such a case, maybe the next problem, if the aneurysm enlarged. But uh, 
an anterior circulation aneurysm after the flow diversion aneurysm when the, it enlarged. Uh, maybe I noticed, yeah, just of aneurysm wall coagulation, maybe one option. Next time I can consider, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, comment. Well, yeah. uh, thank you, Professor Liao, for showing us a very interesting cases and your experience. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Back you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. We indeed had a beautiful second session as well today. So I'll wind this webinar officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kata. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Andy Lam and Professor Sebastian Liao, as well as the chairs, Professor Concesio Diroko and Professor Kazu Rongo for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And today we had around 1,075 people who watched us live. A special thanks to my co-host Liu Boon Seng for joining in today. So until we all meet next, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.